What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit, this is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash malicious compliance. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode. This story's called, Staffing Miscalculations, Not My Problem, I'm doing a bit of spring cleaning on my computer, because we have time for that sort of thing now, deleting some old documents, and boy did I find a doozy. Settle in and apologies in advance, but this is going to be long. Two years ago, while I was still at uni, I worked at a restaurant for a while that sadly closed down because the owners had gotten too old to maintain it. I looked for a new job and quickly found one in another restaurant, which belonged to a big chain and was running as a system catering business instead of a small family-owned casual dining thing that I was used to. But it would pay the bills and make do and I had no problem adapting to a new system. The team around me was incredibly nice and sweet and working with them was actually kind of fun. However, my enthusiasm about the job vanished entirely only weeks after I had started there for two reasons. Number one, the standards, or rather their absence. I was admittedly spoiled by my former job where the owners had had very high standards, but the kitchen in that new place looked absolutely horrible. And the first time I stepped in there to pick up an order, I made a mental note to never ever eat there and tell my friends the same. Number two, the management and the working schedules were an absolute nightmare, and taking advantage of their workers and treating them like dirt apparently was absolutely normal and no one said or did anything against it. Management could step outside to have a smoke every 15 minutes, but if I dared to go to the loo more than two times in an eight-hour shift, I got yelled at for wasting time. Ironically, at the same time, we were encouraged to drink a lot during our shift so we wouldn't get dehydrated since we were running around all the time. Did they think that we would just evaporate all that fluid intake or where exactly did they figure it would go? I was hardly ever allowed to take the 30 minute break that I was legally entitled to as soon as I worked more than six hours or more with the argument that we're too busy right now to allow any breaks, but it was nevertheless always deducted for my hours on the shift sheet and therefore my pay, which I was forced to sign off after every shift with the manager present as per company policy. Even though the information given about the hours I had actually worked were false, not signing was threatened to be considered insubordination in grounds for firing. Luckily, I always made a protocol for myself at home with the actual data. On top of that, it took me 30 minutes to commute to my workplace with public transport, and it routinely happened that I either got a text canceling my entire shift when I was literally 5 minutes away from the restaurant, or, which happened more often, that I came in to work as scheduled on the shift plan and was told to sit down at the bar until they had figured out whether or not they had work for me to do. I usually spent about two hours at the bar on average until they sent me home again for the day. Unpaid, of course. Once they made me sit for four entire hours, refusing to let me leave, until the manager finally decided they had no work for me today after all. I was super annoyed and gritted my teeth the first couple of times after I was being told that that was just how they handled things routinely because they were overstaffed. I still fail to see how that was my problem. However, after this happened several times in a row, I took heart one night and called in an hour before my shift and asked whether or not they were sure I could come in and actually work tonight. Because I was tired for paying for bus tickets to commute to a job I didn't even get to do. My manager yelled at me that I was being insolent for even asking and to come in or he would write me up as a no-show. Of course, I came to work punctually as always and was dragged off to the office by the manager immediately to get a talking to. He told me it was not my place to question the shift plan and that when I was scheduled to work, it should be a given for me to show up and they needed to be able to rely on that. I reminded him, politely but firmly, that I always came in 10 minutes early for my shifts and that I am always reliable but that they weren't. I informed him that I had not been put to work and sent home again several times unpaid when I had already paid for the bus ticket to come and cleared my personal and academic schedule for the shift and that I considered that kind of treatment very disrespectful towards me as an employee, my work, and my time. I told him when I am listed on the shift plan to work, I should be able to expect and rely on them too to be able to work and earn money that night and I was tired of getting the brunt end of the stick for their staffing miscalculations. 
I didn't apply for this job to not be put to work and get sent home unpaid, let alone going home with a minus because I had already paid for the bus ticket to come to work in the first place. He proceeded to yell at me that this was just how gastronomy works. My experience of three waitressing jobs before that one determined that that was a big, fat lie. And he also said, if I didn't like the way they ran this business, I could get another job and good luck getting one with the reference he would write for me. I was livid, but I pulled through my shift and decided on my way home that I was going to do some homework that very night because this could not possibly be legal. So after about two hours of research about workers' rights laws and business regulations in my country, I had come up with a whopping four pages of laws and regulations that they were actively and routinely breaking, and which I could prove they were breaking thanks to my phone records, shift plans, and staffing coordination was done via WhatsApp. If that wasn't leverage, I don't know what is. If I wanted to, I could have gone to the respective authorities and get that shack shut down for good. But I decided I would not yank all my lovely colleagues out of work, since most of them depended on that job. But that I'd rather look for a new job and bide my time until then. Here's the real kicker, though. What my employer evidently either didn't know or chose to ignore was a neat little law in my country that is called Default of Acceptance which basically means that if you're scheduled for a shift by your boss and you show up on time ready to work, but your boss chooses not to put you to work while you are there, you are still entitled to be paid for that shift because you fulfilled your contractual obligations as an employee. You showed up, offered your work and your time as demanded by your boss through the shift sheet, and the lack of work is not your fault. For me, in my situation, it meant I was entitled to be paid for every single shift they had me sit at the bar and send me back home again without giving me anything to do. Then I looked over my carefully kept protocols, detailing exactly for how many hours I had been scheduled to work which day, how long I was there, how long they made me wait, and who had sent me home that day. And I did the math and got the biggest grin you could possibly imagine. So, I sent out some applications and meanwhile kicked off the malicious compliance phase. I did not call in and ask whether or not I could please come in and work and I would shut off my phone for the 30 minute commute to work so they would have no chance to cancel me last minute again before I arrived. If I was on the shift plan, naturally I'd be there. I maliciously complied by playing the dutiful and downbeaten employee who had accepted their miserable fate and was grateful to have a job at all. My manager was very pleased and smug, obviously thinking he broke me. Little did he know he had another thing coming his way. I came to work dutifully without question, never complained about being told to sit down and wait again, and on top of that I made a point of always bringing some homework for uni, which the petty little passive-aggressive lady that I am would demonstratively do while I was expected to sit at the bar, twiddling my thumbs and waiting to have work bestowed upon me. I had decided if I had to comply with this nonsense for some more time, I might as well use that waiting time to my benefit and get some studying done so whenever I was told to sit down and wait to be put to work, I'd smile and say, sure, no problem, I'll wait. Sat down and whipped out my books, knowing fully well that I was entitled to get paid either way because it was their choice not to put me to work and make me wait out my shift. I was even getting weird looks from the guests as I sat there in full work uniform, buried in my books and papers on the counter and studying for my exams. Whenever I was approached by a customer who wanted to order something or complain, I'd smile sweetly and pointedly say, sorry, I'm on standby, please try one of my colleagues. Not only did I get some decent studying done, I literally wrote two papers partly on that counter during those weeks. But them continuing with their policy of demanding me to come in without intending to actually put me to work meant I was piling up hours and hours of default of acceptance. And I kept a protocol of every single delicious second of it meticulously, as well as snapping photos and writing down which staff had been there that day as irrefutable evidence that I had been there, in case this would get legal. After three months in that joint, I had found a new job, and when I came to work the next day after my successful job interview at the next place, I personally handed my manager my termination letter with my usual two weeks notice. He looked very puzzled at that fat envelope I handed him, as an addendum. I had attached the four pages of workers' rights regulations and business laws they were breaking, a copy of my working and waiting protocols of the last three months, 
a table overview of all the default of acceptance hours I had accumulated in those three months, and all the 30-minute breaks I hadn't been allowed to take, plus which superior had denied me to take them that day, and therefore was entitled to get paid for, and a final total of default of acceptance hours and the resulting sum of money I was legally allowed in wages. Underneath that, I had written I expected that money to be added to my last paycheck and that I would consider legal action otherwise since the law was clearly on my side. My manager took the envelope into the office while I got to work, and when he came back to the service floor again, he was white as a sheet of paper. That manager never spoke to me or looked me in the eye again. Pleasure doing business with you too, sir. I maintained a perfect record of showing up to work until the day I left. Curiously, I was always put to work and never asked to wait during the last two weeks. Said goodbye to my lovely colleagues and told them all they had rights and to inform themselves and to not let themselves be taken advantage of by this management anymore. Two weeks later, I got a check with my last month's pay plus everything I had been legally owed and no further comment from management whatsoever. They also completely neglected to write me a reference, by the way, as well as text messages from two more colleagues that they had followed my lead and also quit, moving on to better things. I'm still in contact with them both, and we have become very good friends. Whenever we go out and drive by that place, we roll down the windows and show it the middle finger. It has become a juvenile but fun tradition. I have done some bad jobs in my time, but that one was by far the worst. Thanks for reading, hope you enjoyed. I did enjoy this story, very good writing by the way. Also, kudos to you for actually taking the time to keep all those notes and stuff. If I were to freaking be in that position, I would have definitely been way too lazy. I hate taking notes, even if it will gain me thousands of dollars. I am, I hate notes, I, I just hate them. I'm obviously joking, I'm not that easy guys. Alright, this story is called, The Deadline is Midnight. So, I'm dyslexic before anyone calls me out on grammar or spelling. I'm one of the unfortunate people to be in a key worker position during this situation in the UK, and this happened today. With it being the end of the financial year, everyone was trying to do last minute payments into their ISAs, and all day we were bombarded with customers wanting to pay money in, open accounts, etc. Now, recently, due to how many people are trying to hide their money, our systems have been a little messed up due to the increased traffic to all the call centers, as well as the website, and today was no different. Other than the fact that it's the weekend, which is, one, outside of banking hours, and two, a day when the majority of staff are off. Not to mention the fact that we've cut down our departments a lot because of the situation, and we're getting so far behind that it's looking like it's going to take months maybe even a year to be able to get up to speed with everything once this is over. So if anyone has worked in the financial sector before and know anything about ISAs, you'll know that the government requires all banks and financial institutions to send out what's called a gap letter to make sure that you've not invested in more than one ISA in a tax year. This is important for later. So all day I've had to deal with people complaining that the website won't let them invest in their accounts, and I've had to basically say, I would suggest next time that you invest earlier in the year, but one guy immediately came through and just started hurling abuse at me. Now, in my workplace, I'm known for not really taking abuse from customers unless it's something that we have caused. He's complaining that he can't invest into his ISA because it's telling him he's not allowed, and he can only invest a certain amount. I ask the standard, have you already invested with us this financial year? To which he dances around the question and continues berating me about how he knows the rules and I ask to log him into his account to see what's going on to which, surprise surprise, he has an issue with. Telling me instead of questioning him, I should have been working out the issue from the beginning, demanding to speak to a manager, calling me an idiot and expecting me to know all of his personal details from the one name he gave me at the beginning. On a side note, the amount of people who call up certain places and don't give an account number and expect us to have all the information including your freaking blood type is just ridiculous! The next thing he says as I'm trying to explain that I don't have his information, I want to raise a complaint! Cue the malicious compliance. At this point, I've just about given up trying to help him and I say, okay, I'll just need all of your details to raise this. So he gives them and I offer to still have a look into the issue while making the complaint, which causes another tirade of insults spewing from him about how I need to 
Hurry the hell up! The deadline is midnight! So I carry on making the complaint and tell him, I've raised a complaint for you, sir, and one of our complaint handlers will be in touch with you in the next three working days. But due to the current situation, we're stretched a little thin, so it will take us a little while longer to contact you. I hope your day is as pleasant as you have been to me. And I hang up the phone. The reason that he can't invest? Gap letters are sent from everyone with a 30-day lifespan from their first investment in that financial year. Guess who hadn't sent his back to us from the year before? Yup, the thing is, I could have explained this to him if he had just decided to be nice and patient instead of rude and abusive towards me. But now he'll have to wait up to two weeks for someone to explain this to him. Basically, if you make a call to a call center, be nice to them, because it may just save you a lot of time and effort. Honestly, as someone who's had to be customer service in one form or another, being nice can very much influence someone's ability to pull some strings here and there, you know what I mean? <laughs> Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.